afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the world of Sudan sanctions, where misinformation, disinformation, and misperceptions rule. We hope uh, today to shine just a little light on this subject, um, and hope that, that facts and analysis um, can be re-injected back into the debates over this very, very serious set of issues we're going to tackle today. But first, this is Capitol Hill, so you have to start by thanking people. And we have some very deeply uh, committed members of Congress who have uh, helped sponsor this event, uh, Representatives Royce and Capuano and Rooney and McGovern, four of them may or may not make appearances uh, today. You guys all know uh, how it works. But uh, their support on Sudan issues is uh, without question. I also wanted to thank Representative McCall, who uh, has helped us secure the space today, and, and to our distinguished panel, who I'll introduce uh, before each one of them speaks. Quickly, to lay out the, 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 the context, there, there I think is a, is a fundamental hypothesis that led us to want to sponsor or to put on this event today. And we believe that with the deployment uh, the creation and deployment of a reinvigorated and, and, and innovative peace strategy on the part of the United States and its allies that care about Sudan and have cared about it for many, many decades, that we can positively impact the effort to build a credible peace process in Sudan that has a chance of leading to uh, lasting peace in Sudan. Now, the problem, I think, and your problem analysis largely guides the direction you'll go in terms of your, your solution or prescriptions. But the problem that we see is that most analysts, most policymakers, many journalists think that Sudan is generally stuck, that it's not moving forward, that there aren't, the conditions are not propitious for uh, altering the equation uh, on the ground in Sudan. I think this arises from three faulty assumptions. The first assumption is that conditions in Sudan itself are not right for peace. The second uh, faulty assumption is that it's too late in the Obama administration to initiate something new that has a chance of working in a second tier issue like this. And then the third faulty assumption I think is that the, and this one is the most important one is for, from the Enough Project's view, is that the United States and the international community basically have no leverage in, the, in Sudan anymore. Now on the first one, the idea that Sudan is not right, we're going to turn in a minute to my colleague to my immediate left, Omar Ismail, to tell us why that is not accurate. On the second faulty assumption that it's just too late in this particular administration after your eight years, only eight months left, I think, I beg to differ, I think that the key officials in this uh, administration came uh, into government, came into this executive branch in 2009, having four of the key ones having had, having led Senate efforts on Darfur. The president, uh, the current Secretary of State, um, the white Vice President, these are key folks who have had, uh, I think, profound uh, experiences and were had tremendous uh, <coughs> commitment to Darfur going back a decade. And I don't think they want to leave office without having made it an effort. And the other two that I think about are, uh, are Susan Rice as National Security Advisor and Samantha Power up at the UN, who both were very deeply involved in, in Sudan issues before they went into government. So I think there is certainly brewing in the administration some interest in trying to do something for uh, January 2017. And then the third fault, the assumption that, that the United States has no leverage. Well, this is the main reason we, we put this event together. You know, when, when something matters to the United States, um, we create leverage uh, for the objectives that we want to, uh, to secure. For purposes of counterterrorism, for organized, countering organized crime, uh, for uh, addressing uh, nuclear proliferation issues, we uh, use a number of instruments and policy tools that, that are come to be known as the tools of financial statecraft. 
And these tools have been honed uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 to create new forms of leverage through the international financial system that the United States government never had before. Unfortunately, these tools are conspicuously not used for peace and human rights for countries like Sudan and some of the other countries in the region that have comprised the deadliest war zone in the world by far since World War II. So our theory of change at its essence is that if you create and use leverage through these, these underutilized policy instruments that we're going to talk about today by administration, administration officials who are searching at this point for legacy shaping efforts, we think that would have a real chance of moving the needle in Sudan's moribund peace process. But I'm the moderator, darn it, so I'm going to get off the soapbox and uh, get the show on the road. I've already violated, dramatically violated the tenets of my position. Um, and we're going to start first, and by the way, as with all these kinds of events, if, if any member of Congress does walk in, we'll as quickly as possible make accommodations so that they can say a few words. Um, there is. There is. Don't expand. <laughs> we have to stop the thing more for that than for a member of Congress. Please, have a, have a, have a podium. <laughs> Uh, I'm only going to be brief because uh, I'm sure you know that they just call votes, so uh, they're no longer holding the votes open very often, so very important. So I just want to come by and say thank you to everybody, especially the union and, and others, to uh, keep me the pressure on, to be perfectly honest. I actually think things are feeling better, uh, but I also think that uh, it's, a, it's an appropriate time to reconsider the position and to uh, consider trying to dial some of these things a little more precisely, a little bit more accurately. Uh, and I actually feel reasonable. I don't know see progress in the not too distant future, which uh, is good. I haven't said that in a while. <laughs> uh, and, I will, uh, and I will tell you that you know, we had some discussions on the summit yesterday. Uh, I think the summit, again, may, may be making some progress. Uh, but I will tell you that no progress gets made unless the pressure continues. Uh, and those of us who care about this and those of us who are really concerned about it, we don't step up and we don't speak up, uh, it will be forgotten. Uh, I've said it many, many times. And honestly, in my district, other than a handful of people who are interested in the issue, um, Sudan doesn't play in the average member's district. Uh, it's not an issue that we really don't know much about, and I didn't know much about before I got there. Uh, and it's up to all of us to keep it up, to keep it on the agenda, uh, and to keep people focused on it. Not that we can necessarily solve all the problems of the world, but I will guarantee you that if we don't, this would not be so. So I want to really come by and say thank you. Uh, and we appreciate all the good work that uh, so many of you in this room have done uh, to keep me educated, to keep my feet to the fire, and, and so many others. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. As well, my Congressman Capuano is the, is the co-chair, co-founder even, of the uh, Sudan and South Sudan Caucus, which is really important body on this uh, in, the, in, in the Congress to keep the attention both of the legislative branch but also uh, of the executive branch. So the Congress plays that role in a very important way. Now, we're going to move to lay the foundation now for, for, our, for the argument as it goes forward. I think to, to, in order to do that, we need, to, we need to understand why the situation on the ground in Sudan might, might be ripe for progress as a result of what I think are new regime vulnerabilities. Uh, and to guide us through this, we have Enough Project's senior policy advisor, Omar Ismail, who hails from Darfur. And I've had the honor of traveling uh, frequently into Sudan with Omar, though never strangely with a visa. Thank you, Omar. <laughs> Thank you. It was great to be here. I'll go right into it. Um, my presentation is going to be why the time is right for the approach that we are going to talk about and will be articulated by my colleagues. Um, since the government of the day uh, came to power in June of 1989, they uh, kind of like started an unorthodox way of uh, dealing with the economy of the country. Uh, they coined a word that is um, fascinating to me called tamkin, which is the consolidation of power and the economy within the hands of the of the government. 
and this has uh, led to uh, a collaboration of the uh, Islamist businessmen and a number of tribal clans and families and, and top leaders in the party and the security apparatus with the uh, uh, growing economic power of the uh, party affiliates. This one uh, started from the, the get-go and uh, to be able to consolidate that power, the uh, civil service was emptied out of the qualified people, including the army uh, that brought them to power. Because let us remember, they came to power as a result of the military coup in June of 1989, and the business community. So uh, the general tax breaks that they gave and the benefit that uh, enabled their um, uh, uh, operatives to, call to work also brought in uh, the Sudan armed forces to rise in the ranks to become the third manufacturer and exporter of weapons in Africa after Egypt and South Africa. Uh, there were other covert operations uh, that are largely conducted by NIS, the National Intelligence Security Services, which is known to own private companies, and there were reports that some of these shell companies that are run by NIS amount to over 500 uh, uh, companies. So these companies conduct business in transport, in construction, private security, service stations, uh, petrochemical industries, etc., etc. So this created an area that we call the gray economy, which is thrives in the shadows of the deep state. So that, that, that economy is now continuing to run the country and led to a vast and institutional corruption within uh, the country. And if you look at the corruption index of 2015, you'll find that Sudan's ranked 165th out of 167 countries from around the world. And of course, with that comes the violations of human rights and all this. And if you are looking at the Global Peace Index, you will see that Sudan is ranked 156 out of 162 countries for the same index of 2015. Um, these policies, and, and because they are not policies that are sound and policies that are run through the government organizations and the government systems that we know, it is a parallel economy that is running outside the system that led to this corruption, and the corruption led to the inflation, and the official policies to control the rate of exchange of the Sudanese pound. Again, in the dollar, and the rate of inflation are constantly defeated by the privileges, privileges given to the regime affiliated economic operators. If you look at the forex situation in Sudan today, it is enough that you look at the bank, the central bank itself. This, the, 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 the statistics that are coming from the central bank of Sudan, with regard to the export revenue, the Central Bank of Sudan in, in the last quarterly report for 2015 gave their provincial total as $3.2 billion, down by $1.2 billion from 2014. And the forex situation is dwindling. Uh, that it happened since 2015, uh, 2011 when South Sudan succeeded, taking with it in some reports what amounts to 90% of the uh, foreign currency. So the government shifted, trying to, re to re rely on gold and some other um, measures. One of them is that Sudan relies on donations, loan deposits from friendly Arab Gulf states like Qatar and Saudi Arabia lately, and uh, some of the uh, Asian partners uh, like China and India uh, trying to address the budget deficits and to stabilize the rate of exchange. Uh, Internally, and to make this look like uh, the country is running on uh, sound policies, they kept on concealing records and basically outright uh, telling false statements to the, to the public so that they will not steer any sort of uh, uh, um, unrest or instability. And uh, in foreign policy, they tried jumping from one sponsor or country or affiliate to another, they were in the Iranian uh, uh, um, um, axis, if you will, and then they jumped to now the Saudi axis, and they are uh, sending Sudanese uh, soldiers that are dying in Yemen, uh, all in the name of uh, getting foreign currency and donations uh, from, these, uh, from these countries. Uh, if we look 
at the overall weakness of the economy today, we find that the budget uh, of, the, of the government, if you look at it officially today, you find that 25% of it is allocated for military and security spending, which we all know that is not true. Uh, but some of the sources say that up to 70% is uh, allocated to these activities, and spending on and, and military is responsible for the uh, civil unrest and also the destruction of the civil society and the political parties that are vying for change in the country. This shows us what kind of priorities that this government had in allocation of its resources. In the gold sector, the artisanal mining uh, is uh, producing some of the, uh, the most of the gold that is in the country today. Uh, if it is skipped, uh, the uh, vast network of um, smuggling that is happening in the country, then the central bank will scrape something and they will buy the gold and, and, and sell it and dealing in this gold uh, led to uh, the uh, government trying to uh, spend on the um, important uh, uh, government programs. Uh, but it still, um, it wasn't enough to bring the government the products that is needed and basically today it is safe to say that the government of Sudan is running on empty. So, time is now for us to look at these vulnerabilities and use them as uh, a leverage to be able to engage with Sudan and to change the situation if it is possible. It is time now for us to look at the banking and also look at the gold sector and look at the NIS activities, that is the National Intelligence uh, Service, and also uh, to see that this um, economic, uh, economic situation in the country uh, is ripe for our external intervention if that is going to help and, and, and that is exactly where we are going. In terms of encouraging the change in Sudan, I believe as a Sudanese here in this panel, I would say it is up to the Sudanese people inside the country to uh, take the charge of changing their country. However, we are going to help them with the tools that we have from outside and that is investing in the people of Sudan rather than investing of a government that is going to go tomorrow or the day after. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. <laughs> what, what's intrigued me about this also is that uh, at, at this moment of all this convergence of, of uh, economic uh, weakness, uh, you have the added vulnerability that has been produced somewhat inadvertently by uh, a tightening of uh, sanctions enforcement, uh, largely driven by Iran over the last, uh, Iran policy over the last few years, that led to some significant fines um, that hopefully we'll be talking about throughout the course of this uh, session, but that um, uh, serendipitously, in, from depending on where you're sitting, um, had a chilling effect on economic activity, especially of the uh, folks and se senior members of the ruling party in the military and the NIS who control large amounts of the uh, export-import uh, uh, economy in Sudan. And so our assessment politically is, and you've been instrumental in helping us understand this, uh, is that sanctions relief has, for the most part, replaced or at least certainly runs parallel with deputy <coughs> as principal regime preoccupations uh, in Khartoum in their foreign policy efforts, all of the spin that we see about how sanctions are, are hurting the, the population in Sudan, uh, largely driven by the fact that they're, that the, the, the businesses that uh, senior members of the regime have uh, been running for many years are now at risk, that banking is it's much harder to, to bank internationally because of the the, uh, the sanctions, uh, the enforcement of the sanctions, let's put it that way. And I think the under, for those of us in this room, if we're going to understand why this is a moment, you have to understand the impact that this twist in the story about Sudan sanctions, uh, has, how that twist has unfolded. Um, it's not the sanctions, it's the enforcement of sanctions. And so um, with that, I think it's very important now to understand a couple other cases where financial pressure has helped catalyze progress um, in, in, in for various, for different objectives, but uh, in, in two different countries. And 
Peter Harrell is here, we're lucky for us, from the, uh, he's an adjunct senior fellow at the, at the Center for New American Security. Um, uh, and he's going to tell us a bit about Iran and Burma, but more importantly, he was de uh, uh, Deputy Secretary for Counter Threat Finance and Sanctions. I love that, Counter Threat, threat Finance. It's kind of cool. Um, at, at the State Department's Economic Bureau uh, from 2012 to 2014. So he was right in the middle of these and many other relevant foreign policy experiences that we are going to benefit from now. Thank you, Peter, for coming. Yeah, thank you, and, and really thanks, John and Brad, uh, for inviting me uh, to participate on the panel today, and, and thanks to all of you for giving me the chance to speak. Um, uh, John asked me to speak about some of the lessons uh, of other sanctions regimes and how those might be applied to the Sudan uh, case. Particular focus on Iran and Burma, uh, both countries I worked on extensively at the State Department and been writing on uh, since, leaving, uh, since leaving the State Department about a year and a half ago. Um, you know, I could go on at some great length. I will spare you the great length. I just want to summarize my lessons, distill them down uh, to kind of five key lessons that I took away from, from really three years of uh, active work on sanctions programs, including the Sudan sanctions program, though. I have to say, at, at that time, it was one that was, frankly, kind of stuck. It uh, was sort of fairly steady state then. It uh, was not getting probably the attention that it should have. And so I think now is actually a very good time uh, for the release of this report, because I do think there's a real opportunity to revisit it. Uh, that's in the first of those um, uh, uh, lessons that I took away. Um, and a way of picking up on what John was just talking about, about enforcement, was it's important to not to do half measures uh, as sanctions. You know, one of the things we have seen over the last couple of years uh, is that there is often a, um, some crisis breaks out, and there's often a, a, a rush uh, to do something about it. And sometimes some, frankly, half measure sanctions will be the kind of thing uh, the policymakers come up with because, you know, it's complicated and you're hurried and you haven't really thought you're through your strategies, so you're just, we'll just put some sanctions out there. Rarely an effective approach because you're not really changing the calculus of the government you are uh, trying to target if you're just doing the <coughs> so You really have to take uh, a tough-minded uh, and comprehensive approach to your sanctions, and that means kind of three things. First, it means you've got to have pretty broad uh, sanctions, a lot of prohibited activity. You have to go after the major sources of economic revenue, the major sources of financial strength for the country you're trying to go after. Uh, second, you need to enforce. Um, you know, one of the things we had seen in kind of the 2000s period, uh, really until the late 2000s, was there wasn't a very uh, aggressive enforcement uh, climate uh, on sanctions, just in terms of corporations that were violate, violating sanctions were getting away with it. And that really changed, as John noted, coming out of the Iran case in the late 2000s, uh, sort of 2008, 2009, 2010, really saw a shift in mentality and a lot more enforcement, which got the global corporate sector, not only in the U.S., but around the world, to take things a lot more seriously. And finally, you need, in terms of the first lesson here, no half measures, you need an aggressive pace of designations. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with a, with a rogue regime, uh, they're always out there setting up front companies. They're trying to circumvent uh, what you have in place. And so if you're going to be serious about this, you really need an aggressive posture uh, out of the U.S. government to keep sanctioning the new front companies, the businesses that are doing business with those front companies, to keep up the pressure and make sure those circumvention channels uh, don't remain uh, open. So the second lesson, uh, and one that I think a lot of us have, have um, really taken to heart over the last couple of years, is the need to get your allies on board and keep them uh, on board. Uh, you know, we would not have accomplished what we accomplished in Iran, putting a lot of pressure on Iran, and then with a savvy negotiating track, if we hadn't gotten our allies around the world, particularly in Europe, but also in Asia and elsewhere. Uh, if we hadn't gotten them on board, we would not have been able to bring them. Uh, as much uh, pressure to bear as we did. Now, the secret of getting your allies on board that I think sometimes doesn't get talked about as much as it should is that there is a push and a pull uh, to getting your allies on, on board. I think as a diplomat, former diplomat, we often talked about the, uh, the pull of getting our allies on board. You know, we go out, we negotiate, we cajole, that kind of thing. But there's also a push, and I think that's a very important part of this. When we were ramping up pressure on Iran, we started putting pressure on the European banks, on European businesses, and others that were doing business uh, with Iran. We were starting to threaten to cut those businesses off uh, from access to the United States. 
And so while we went to the European governments and said, you all really need to come along and should come along and made lots of policy arguments, uh, and that was an important part of the strategy, they also needed to feel some heat uh, from us. And that was the sort of getting your allies on board as both diplomatic cajoling, but also you know, holding uh, the corporate sectors, uh, overseas corporate sectors, feet to the fire uh, to get them to come along. Third lesson I'd take uh, from both the uh, Iran and the Burma experience uh, is that you have to have a diplomatic game plan. You know, you're not going to win with pressure for pressure's sake. I mean, you might be able to box in an adversary. You might be able to make it harder for them uh, to do uh, what they want to do. Um, but the fact is you're not going to bring about a strategic change in approach by your adversary uh, if you don't also have a talking track, if you don't have a diplomatic track. Uh, which we had uh, in both um, Burma and in uh, the Iran context. Iran, very well known, P5 plus one process with a number of our uh, allies in Europe and on the, in, in China and Russia uh, working on that. Um, and you know, that was a slow process, but it was very important throughout uh, the pressure uh, track that we had that negotiating process there. When the Iranians were ready to change course, they understood there was a way to negotiate themselves out of the box that we had uh, put them uh, in. The fourth lesson I take away, and one that I think too often gets overlooked, is that you have to keep the lines of communication uh, and support to everyday people open. Uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of talk uh, lately, over the last couple of years, about some of the adverse impacts that sanctions uh, have had on humanitarian relief uh, efforts in countries under embargo, on things like selling medicine, food uh, to uh, countries uh, under embargo. And it is certainly true that given the enforcement environment out there, and given the, the understandable and appropriate uh, risk aversion we're seeing out of the corporate uh, sector around sanctions, that absent US government engagement, you will see it harder for humanitarian NGOs, for pharmaceutical companies to you know, provide medicine, food, relief into these places. But that is a solvable problem. Uh, it is very clear that with uh, good and effective outreach uh, from the U.S. government to the relevant financial institutions, you know, food and medicine companies and NGOs, you can actually facilitate those kinds of transactions even as you're putting pressure uh, on the uh, regime itself. I mean, I remember in the Iran context, the sort of 2012, 2013, early 2014, at kind of the height of the escalatory pressure uh, period. We were also, a colleague of mine from the Treasury Department and I were also meeting directly with banks, with NGOs, <coughs> with, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, agribusiness companies, to make sure that those kinds of allowed transactions could happen, and developing some channels to let those happen. So I think this is just a myth that sanctions necessarily have these collateral uh, consequences. It's true if you don't think them through up front, that'll happen, but that's a solvable problem. And the final point, uh, final point I would say, is that you have to have a certain amount of patience. You know, sanctions are not something that are necessarily going to work in three or four months. I mean, you, know, you always hope that uh, you'll get lucky and they will, but you know, there, there, there is an um, escalating uh, economic effect generally. You know, the things get worse economically for your target country over time. Uh, and you got to be prepared to take some time. Uh, and you can't give up uh, too soon. That's not to say you shouldn't adjust course a little bit, you know, as new realities. Uh, as new realities uh, come into play, but you, know, you, you got to be prepared for at least a mid-haul here uh, and not to give up on the course, uh, course too quickly because uh, then you'll just waste the leverage you have uh, spent time uh, building uh, for yourself. So I think with that, I'll just leave it there as, as five key lessons from a couple of other contexts. Well, I, I smell a TED Talk, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I wasn't back in school for a second. That was exciting. I don't know how people get their kicks around here, but that was that's my style right there. <laughs> uh, now let's let's uh, turn back to Sudan with those really valuable lessons. Um, uh, the essential argument I think that that, we, that at least some of us up here are trying to convey uh, today is that Sudan is the very definition of, of what we call a violent kleptocracy, where corruption and, and self enrichment aren't aberrations uh, in the system, but they're actually the purpose of the system itself. They're the objectives of the government's 
the leading figures in the government's maintenance of power through any means necessary. Uh, and that is uh, mass atrocities and, and, and counterinsurgency on the periphery. And as we're seeing unfold and we'll see, I'm sure, in the next week in response to, to some of the um, uh, activity uh, in the streets in Khartoum, we're seeing, you know, we'll see even more uh, uh, deadly repression uh, uh, by, by the regime there. And so when you have a violent kleptocracy, the only way with those kinds of motivations for staying in power, the only way, I think, the most effective way to disrupt that and alter the calculations, the calculus, as Peter said, of the regime uh, there is to go after the money, the ill-gotten gains, uh, uh, and the illicit financial activity that uh, helps to continue to the, 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 the looting machine, as, as, uh, as that well-known book uh, was titled very recently by the Financial Times reporter. Um, we looked at uh, uh, today at Burma now and in Iran, and, and, and uh, we talked about uh, counterterrorism uh, after September 11, and you see the, the development, slow, steady development of, of an array of instruments, uh, or refinement, let's say, of an array of instruments uh, to build that leverage that we think could actually shift the calculations of those in power in Khartoum from war to peace uh, uh, over time, or sufficiently to at least consider uh, more uh, the, the, uh, the efforts that uh, Sudanese throughout the country are making in support of peace. So, and then you connect, and then here's Peter's uh, uh, thir third point, uh, the diplomatic game plan. You need to connect the financial pressures we're about to talk about to a diplomatic game plan that's much more nuanced than it is today that's focused on the support for a more inclusive, comprehensive peace process in Sudan. Right now, the Sudanese government has gotten away with this bifurcated and trifurcated uh, stovepiped uh, diplomatic effort that allows for a number of different initiatives at the same time, playing them off against each other, dividing the opposition, picking off one by one. Look, I don't blame them. They're trying to stay in power. That's what they do. And if they're not, if they're not, if they're outwitting a, 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 a clumsy international response, more power to them. They're just going to keep destroying the country and keep uh, dividing the opposition, and we will not see peace in Sudan. So we don't expect them to do anything differently until the calculus has changed. And I do think that some of the kinds of economic pressures that we're going to talk about in the next uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, are, are those that could, if connected to a diplomatic, a, a more effective diplomatic game plan, have at least the chance of moving the needle towards peace, uh, much more than, than has been the case up till now. So I want to move now to uh, the actual package of pressures that would actually make a difference, in our view. Uh, uh, and, and to do that, I'm going to turn to an expert like Peter on uh, these financial tools. Enough uh, policy director, Brad Brooks. Uh, before we do that, <laughs> we have uh, yet another Massachusetts representative. This is very exciting because the game. Yeah, Massachusetts here, yeah. <coughs> uh, Kept left, but we're, 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 I'm just getting all excited about tonight's game. Uh, sorry. If anything to do with uh, Boston or uh, the great state of Massachusetts, I'm, uh, I could. How you doing? Good to see you. Representative McGovern, please, yeah, this is how it works. All right, how about a, I'm out of breath because I ran over here. Uh, we had some votes on some meaning, meaningless things. So let me just say that I want to thank the Enough Project and all the panelists for coming here today and sharing with us your ideas about how to strengthen and rejuvenate uh, the effort to hold the government of Sudan accountable for the genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity that President Bashir and his government have committed against the people of Sudan, and I look in this room and there are a lot of people who have been working on this issue for an awful long time, and uh, quite frankly, I think we could use a, a shot in the arm or a good kick in the butt, uh, because uh, like many other members of Congress, I first became engaged in Sudan because of the mass atrocities uh, that were being committed against the people of Darfur. That was a little over 10 years ago. Um, and on April 28, 2006, I, I got arrested for the first time as a member of Congress, <laughs> uh, near DuPont Circle, uh, there were five of us, uh, myself, Tom Lantos, John Alder, Jim Moran, Sheila Jackson Lee, five religious and student leaders from the 
Save Darfur coalition. It took place just two days before their April 30th Save Darfur rally to stop genocide in the National Mall, where tens of thousands of people marched and rallied to protest the genocide in Darfur. I've been arrested uh, twice more protesting in front of the Sudanese embassy with several of my congressional colleagues and uh, leaders of the religious and peace, student civil rights, and foreign policy or, um, organizations with John Prendergast and uh, George Clooney. I have a picture of that in my office and everybody stops and looks at the picture of George Clooney, but it opens the discussion uh, onto this topic of Sudan. But those days uh, feel like a long time ago. And it often feels to me like the passion has gone out of this fight, uh, or at least on Capitol Hill and in the administration. And I worry when geno genocide feels like it's commonplace, when it begins to feel like it's no big deal. So for three Congresses in a row, my former colleague and co-chair of the Tom Landos Human Rights Commission, Frank Wolf, uh, and, I, and I introduced legislation that would strengthen and enhance sanctions against Sudan, not just for Darfur, but for war crimes against the people of South Kordofan and Blue Nile, and the ever-shrinking political space for all the Sudanese people. The Sudan Peace, Security, and Accountability Act. But despite often having more than 100 bipartisan co-sponsors, we could never persuade the House Foreign Affairs Committee to mark it up, and John Prendergast knows very well about this struggle. This year, in fact, right now, the bipartisan co-chairs of the Human Rights Commission and the bipartisan Sudan and South Sudan Issues Caucus are circulating a letter in the House to President Obama asking that he reprioritize Sudan and put it on the top of his agenda for the remainder of his time in office. Over 90 members from both sides of the aisle have joined the letter and it's open until noon tomorrow, uh, Friday, in case uh, any of you who are here representing congressional offices, if your boss is not on it, please get them on it. So I welcome the suggestions and recommendations of the panel today. We have to think creatively. Uh, we have to think out of the box. We need to target and strengthen our sanctions so that uh, Bashir and his cronies feel the pain, not the Sudanese people. And we have to make sure that the Treasury Department and the State Department are tracking all the ways Bashir is attempting to get around the sanctions and who is helping him do that. Congress has always led on this issue, uh, and that leadership and support has always been bipartisan. So I hope that we will have over 100 members on, that, on the letter that's circulating, and I hope that we in Congress, not just the administration, will also prioritize the tragedy that continues to take place uh, before our very eyes in Sudan. And again, to all the panelists here, I thank you for all the great work that you have done on this issue for so many years, and uh, I turn it back over to you. Don't sleep at night and dream about what a member of Congress should and could be like. It's representing the government. Uh, domestic foreign policy across the board, he has been a champion of the causes that I think people in this room share and hold very dear, near, to, near and dear to our hearts. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Um, uh, Now, we were just in the process of introducing my colleague here, Brad Brooks Rubin, who the measures we talk about and really try to get at some of the lessons uh, that I learned both at Treasury and at State, uh, working uh, alongside Peter on, from my perspective, conflict diamonds and conflict minerals, but in the same office with people working on, on sanctions issues. Um, and what the first thing that you see, I think, when we, we think about sanctions with respect to, or, and, and pressures overall with respect to Sudan, and in many cases, the other countries that we end up work on, is that they pretty much don't meet any of the lessons and any of the criteria that Peter uh, laid out before. And, and what we're trying to do is make the argument about why those should be the case. When I worked at um, the Treasury Department, I was in the office of the Chief Counsel for OFAC, uh, so one of the lawyers who got to work on what OFAC was doing. Uh, and when you, uh, OFAC, for those who don't know, is divided sort of um, by function. So there's a licensing division, an enforcement division, and those people work on all kinds of sanctions programs. The lawyers work by country program, so you see everything that's happening with respect to that sanctions <coughs> program. And I, um, I was joking earlier, my uh, my MO when I worked there was don't work on Cuba and don't work on Iran, uh, which I was successful at. Um, uh, so most of my programs were sub-Saharan African programs. Um, and so it was an interesting perspective to be able to work on Sudan and Liberia and Congo and Zimbabwe and again see that most of what we did in those sanctions programs, certainly at the time I worked on them, was hurry up, issue an executive order, put some people on a list, and then that was pretty much it. Uh, and so there was the idea that 
sanctions really fit into a broad foreign policy that was going to be sustained, that was going to be broad, that was going to be enforced, um, and that was going to lead somewhere was often really not the case. It was uh, a matter of, of making a statement, saying something, and then moving on. And I would sit in my staff meetings and see all the creative thinking that was happening around enforcement and around new kinds of pressures, and, and recognizing that very little of that was being translated over, over to uh, the conflicts I was working on at the sanction side, and now uh, been able to bring that here to enough. So, um, with the idea that the aim of any modernized approach to sanctions is reaching what what um, what John just spoke about in terms of getting to a new process that's a new transition to democracy type progress or a transition to peace progress, that's the ultimate goal. With any kind of pressure systems, you want to, if it's not changing behavior, you want pressures and, and sanctions to get to a process that will change behavior. Sometimes sanctions aren't what ultimately changes behavior, but at least you get to that, at least you get to that process. And so what we um, have done is think about, okay, what, as the last 10 years have gone on, there has been a lot of creative thinking and a lot of real creative effort, uh, both in looking at sanctions enforcement. Uh, so this is really a raft of cases that have, uh, penalty cases that have come out, both from Treasury, from Justice, from the New York State prosecutors, looking at how the banking sector was exposed to sanctions programs that were already in existence um, and that were already broad, but were not really being sufficiently enforced. There's been a years now of, of large cases that really have started to <coughs> that sort of shook the environment. And then through a lot of the measures that, uh, that Peter referred to over the course of the last eight to 10 years, things especially with respect to Iran, trying to be creative, trying to look at the ways that regimes uh, are getting around the old school sanctions and trying to update those and find new pressures. The Sudan sanctions model is part of the old school. The sanctions were imposed in 1997 when even putting people on lists and the idea of targeted sanctions was a new concept that had only really started in the mid-90s. Um, there was an update to do that with respect to Darfur in 2006, but really what we're looking at with the Sudan sanctions regime and Sudan pressures are things that were developed 20 years ago in a very different kind of universe and a very different kind of approach. And we do think, based on uh, obviously what Omar said earlier in terms of where the regime is and all the lessons we have learned from Iran and from Burma, that now is a time to, to try to deploy some of these pressures uh, with, uh, targeted at Sudan. So what, what are some of these pressures? And again, there could be sort of endless list, but what we tried to do in the report and with our argument is really hone in what are the ones that really target the, the, the life, the last economic lifelines of the regime and have demonstrated some level of success in other cases. So that, to us, starts with banking. Um, the Sudan sanctions are comprehensive with, for US persons, no imports, no exports, no financial transactions. That means US banks, other than cases where there's a license, largely don't have direct banking relationships uh, with Sudanese financial institutions. But, um, as Peter mentioned, in that push-pull process of getting allies on board, uh, the Sudanese banking system is connected to the international financial system through correspondence and intermediaries around the world. Um, much of that is normal economic activity and business activity for ordinary Sudanese citizens that you want to continue, but some of it is the essence of this activity of the, the, the facilitation of corruption, the processing of transactions for companies owned by the NIS, uh, for processing of transactions that fuel the weapons sector in Sudan. And so our belief is that you start with what, with how uh, the administration did it, the Bush administration did it more than 10 years ago, starting to go to those banks directly and go to, go to our allies and say, this is who you're doing business with, this is what this business is resulting in, and it is time to make some more fundamental choices about what that business is. Uh, and whether you want to continue to access the U.S. financial system or have partner relationships with U.S. banks or continue to do the business that you're doing uh, with these kinds of transactions in Sudan. And because of the impact of these major bank cases, you know, most of my former colleagues at Treasury now work at large banks and our compliance officials and our 
doing the kind of due diligence and vigilance every day, looking at transactions, trying to understand who is benefiting, who the beneficial owners are of uh, the companies that are involved or what this activity is all about, that's the kind of diligence that they need to apply in the Sudanese sector. And then we need to be ready to follow that up in addition to just approaching the banks and putting that on the table. You follow that up with uh, some of the measures that were developed in the Iran context over the course of several years, largely called secondary sanctions that were either developed by legislation or by the, uh, by the executive branch, but that give the administration the opportunity to pick from a range of measures. We're not gonna freeze the assets of major European banks, but you can target them and say that there will be some consequences that impact your ability to access the US financial system if these kinds of activities continue. Um, those kinds of measures had a huge impact. Uh, and I know uh, Peter and, and my colleagues at State spent a lot of time traveling around uh, Europe and Asia and elsewhere trying to explain what those, mess what those consequences could be and how they could work and really the choice that's there. And we think, again, it's, it's time to, as, uh, as Representative said, it's time to, to put Sudan back at the level that, we, that we've had around at for, for a long time. So that's banking. Gold is really the next uh, category of, uh, of, of pressures, of sanctions, of both economic sanctions that are in, administered by OFAC at the Treasury Department, but also any money laundering measures that are implemented by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Gold is a key lifeline at this point for the regime. And again, there have been a range of measures developed over time to deal with commodities like this. So you have industry-led due diligence is actually one way to start. Going to the gold industry, there are a range of industry bodies that have looked at in issues like conflict gold in Congo, thanks in large part to work done by the Enough Project, um, pushing the industry, whether it's the refineries, whether it's the jewelry industry, whether it's other downstream users, again, to understand where their gold comes from, to understand the consequences of sourcing gold from supply chains that may begin uh, in conflict regions in Sudan. That's where it can start. Again, sort of like with the banks, you start at the private sector, you lay out what the, what the, what the concerns are, and then you follow that up with the potential for real measures. What can those measures be? They can be additional restrictions on transactions that, that involve the gold sector, or they can eventually lead to uh, what are called sectoral sanctions. Sectoral sanctions were developed more recently in the Russia-Ukraine Ukraine context. One element of the sectoral sanctions that's had a particular impact is the idea that you prohibit new investment in a particular kind of commodity. So as the gold sector is, uh, is an area where Sudan is trying to develop and find new investment and move from artisanal production to industrial production, you can use sectoral sanctions to limit the kind of financing, limit the kind of investment that foreign financial institutions and others in the private sector can make into that sector. So you start with banking, you go to gold, and then it's really the, the getting at the corruption, the, the violent kleptocracy that, uh, that John spoke, spoke about. Anti-corruption sanctions are, are one way to do that, using designation criteria to say that what is of concern and what can result in asset freeze uh, and other kinds of targeted measures is participation and facilitation of public corruption uh, in Sudan. Just last week, we saw a new executive order issued with respect to Libya that included as designation criterion the misappropriation of, uh, of assets that are de destined for public companies. That's exactly the kind of thing that's happening in Sudan. This is exactly the kind of thing that needs to be targeted and needs to be incorporated into how our policy develops. Um, our report is largely focused at the executive branch, but since we're sitting here in Capitol Hill, uh, the passage of the Global Magnitsky Act is another, uh, another element that needs to be addressed, that there needs to be a push on uh, during this Congress to get that passed to ensure that the measures that were developed, again, in another context, can have a, a real impact here in the, in, the, in the Sudan context. And then lastly, really to come back to a lesson that Peter talked about is enforcement. It's great to put all of these things on, it's great to come up with these ideas, are you gonna enforce them? And again, Sudan has not been one of the sanctions programs that has been uh, a major target of enforcement. Now it's been wrapped up in major bank cases like BNP Paribas had an enormous 
component to it that was a Sudan element, but I think we can all recognize that wasn't really where it started, that wasn't the driving force. That's what does need to, to happen with respect to Sudan. Enforcement, resources at Treasury, at Commerce, at other agencies need to be devoted to looking into uh, to Sudan cases. You don't necessarily need to use all of these pressures. I think one of the lessons that Peter talked about was be broad, but you also have to be strategic in what you do. And we're trying to develop a range of ideas, a range of tools that can be on the table for consideration, for evaluation, find the right ones, and really start to develop that push-pull model. Um, as Peter also said, you need to really make sure that you're keeping those channels open to, uh, to the ground and addressing the concern that sanctions, that financial pressures, that economic pressures can have on the populations. And again, just as there have been a range of, uh, of creative measures developed in the last many years around pressures, there's also been on the mitigation side. So uh, in the report, we target several ideas there. Uh, and just to quickly highlight a couple that I think are, are, are most important. Simple, simple messaging from the administration. Uh, I mean, Peter talked about going and taking visits to, to banks, to agribusiness companies, to continue to do the kind of business that is allowed, that is a priority for the U.S. government. <coughs> Again, let's make, those, let's make those steps with respect to Sudan. Let's ensure that those activities that are brought under the scope of general licenses um, or are exempt from san sanctions altogether are transactions that companies are willing to take. Uh, and that requires clear messaging, and that requires a clear strategy, uh, but it can be done. Certainly the risk with any of these kinds of new measures is, is wholesale de-risking, where financial institutions in the private sector say, we simply don't want to do any business at all in Sudan, in East Africa, on the continent altogether. And I, having worked on conflict minerals and conflict diamonds, have uh, been a part of these kinds of discussions in other contexts. And sanctions are complicated, pressures are complicated, um, but they can, they can be talked through, you can get there. I, when I worked at Treasury, had someone call me once and say, you know, uh, I worked on Cote d'Ivoire uh, sanctions in the executive order, and I had a company call up, they're very proud of the fact that they had made sure that they weren't doing any business in Cote d'Ivoire, to which I responded, there are three people on our sanctions list on Cote d'Ivoire. There are more people in Chicago on our sanctions list than there are in Cote d'Ivoire, so it's nice that you realize we have sanctions in place, but you need to understand what they are and how they work, and to be responding to them appropriately. Um, the Burma Responsible Investment Reporting Requirements are another important uh, development that were, that were made along the, the push-pull of the, the Burma program um, that I think are really important to highlight. As we do any level of encouraging business to go in, the, the Responsible Investment Reporting Requirements uh, lay out the idea that if you're gonna do a certain level of business in a country, you need to report on what you're doing. You need to be publicly demonstrating that you're implementing things like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, that you're respecting human rights due diligence processes, environmental processes, and other things that are of concern, and that you're willing to be public about that and demonstrate what you're doing. These have been enormously impactful in the Burma context, and we think they can be uh, in Sudan. And then last but not least, the last you know, lesson that Peter mentioned was kind of continue feels like an, a, a pressure in the enforcement side, but actually it has an element of, of mitigation, which is just be clear who the companies are that you're targeting. There haven't been names added to the, the Sudan sanctions list in a very long time. So there's a lot of mystery and concern that we don't know who we're doing business with and we don't know where that business is going. There needs to be a full-scale effort to add more to the list so that companies understand the, the playing field and they can get in and do the business that, uh, that we'd encourage. Other measures like ensuring the Treasury is adding licensing, that's general licensing or, or expedited consideration. You can read them all in the report. Um, hopefully I've, uh, I've hit on some of the highlights and happy to certainly answer questions as we go through the You just saved your job with that one. <laughs> so now, now we want to uh, get a couple discussants into the mix. Um, and first up is Andrea Prasal from uh, Human Rights Watch, Deputy Director here in Washington office. And Andrea brings a really deep and, and diverse legal background uh, to, the, to this panel here and, and a, a long commitment to human rights issues. And so 
I'm eager to hear what, uh, what you're going to tell us today. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I really want to thank the Enough Project for, for doing this and to the members of Congress and their staff who are so devoted to trying to find some form of justice for the people of Sudan. Um, at nine and a half months pregnant, it needs to be a really exciting event to get me out. And I'm here, so I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm glad that so many of you are. Um, what I'd like to do, uh, I'm, I'm from Human Rights Watch. We do human rights analysis um, and reporting. And what I'd like to do is do just a sort of a quick summary of, of human rights on the ground in Sudan as we see it now. And what that summary will show you, I hope, is that we have not seen any change on the ground in Sudan that would justify any lifting or softening of sanctions. Now, sanctions remain an incredibly important tool, particularly individual targeted sanctions as a form of accountability. And the, the types of things that the Enough Project is talking about, I think, are really valuable to get us to talk about, well, what is the purpose of these sanctions? What are we trying to obtain out of it? But there also has been, over the last several months uh, in Washington, a conversation about actually lifting or softening sanctions, and I think it's, it's wholly inappropriate. Um, I, I'm going to be very brief, so I'm gonna run through what is unfortunately a really depressing litany of human rights abuses in Sudan and, uh, and look forward to discussing sort of how that, that fits in with this broader framework. The first is uh, the issue of freedom of assembly and expression. We have documented, as have others, the Sudanese government um, using excessive force to disperse protests. In particular, in recent months, there's been a crackdown on um, student activists, students protesting who've been imprisoned, um, subject to beatings, other forms of ill treatment. Um, there is very little opportunity for independent investigation into human rights abuses in Sudan, which ties very closely to, uh, to another problem, which is restrictions on media freedom. So there are, there are restrictions on the freedom of assembly and expression, as well as a really limited independent media. So reporting on these restrictions is, is quite limited. Um, so as I've said, we've documented you know, arbitrary detention and killing of, of peaceful protesters. Of course, not all protesters are peaceful. It doesn't warrant um, arbitrary detention and torture of them, but in addition, the arbitrary detention and, and killing of wholly peaceful protesters. Um, the shutting down of civil society groups has been rampant and, and has really continued um, you know, persistently over the years. Um, Omar referred to the National Intelligence and Security Service, and again, we and others have documented really serious abuses by the intelligence branch uh, in Sudan, including torture against real and perceived political opponents. Um, we documented torture and abuse of detainees following protests in 2011, 2012, and 2014. So again, this is a pattern that has not shifted at all in recent years. Um, and then another area that, that's of very serious concern is, is women's rights and sexual violence. We have documented the use of sexual violence as a method of war by, uh, in particular, the rapid security forces and others. Um, sometimes the systematic nature is more apparent uh, in some cases than in others, but nevertheless, women continue to suffer sexual violence at the hands of security forces um, and, and others. Um, we recently documented women human rights defenders and their attempts to have their voices heard in Sudan and the um, less egregious but nevertheless um, powerful forms of, of wearing them down, of really suppressing their voices. And again, when, what I think sort of my theme today is we have these rampant human rights abuses that in particular are targeted at preventing people from resisting them. It's not just that the human rights abuses are happening, it's that civil society and activists who are trying to protest them are also being suppressed. And um, you know, when it comes to women, there, there are a number of sort of everyday harassment of women who choose to wear pants, who, who don't cover their hair. Um, women have been sentenced to death for the crimes of apostasy and adultery. Um, crimes that, you know, to many of us sitting here still sound very uh, stone age, and yet nevertheless women are, are suffering because of these crimes. Um, and, and the systematic discrimination is part of Sudanese law. This isn't, you know, uh, rogue police officers who are roaming the streets and decide to harass women. This is part of the legal structure. Um, and then the final point, because I do want to be brief and, and hear from comments, is, is the total lack of accountability. I mean, we've had Remember, we are 10 years out from when the world really started paying attention to Sudan, and we've seen virtually no real accountability. 
Um, ten years ago, the Security Council decided to refer the situation in Darfur to the International Criminal Court, uh, which has issued arrest warrants, including for the president of Sudan, um, for war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, the crimes that, as an international community, we have said are the most serious crimes. Um, and yet we have seen no accountability whatsoever. So to return to the sanctions that I mentioned at the outset, individual targeted sanctions are a form of accountability. Uh, they are not the same as criminal accountability, of course, but um, the United States, of course, cannot impose criminal accountability on, on people in Sudan. It, the U.S. support for the International Criminal Court is incredibly valuable, and the international system is incredibly valuable. But the continued, where appropriate, use of targeted sanctions is at least one thing that, that this government and that other governments can do to send a message that there will not be impunity for the sort of rampant human rights abuses that, that I've described. Um, so again, not a cheery picture, but um, I think it's, it's easy to forget when we're talking about sort of tools and structures and, and, um, and the political environment, what's happening to the people every day uh, in Sudan. Um, I wish we could report even more on it. Our access is um, not as, as um, free as we would like. Um, nevertheless, we work closely with a, a network of Sudanese activists who are really the heroes in uh, in all of these cases and try to bring that documentation. If you're interested in anything that I've discussed, all of our reporting is on our website, hrw.org. Um, and if you search for Sudan, you'll get a list of you know all of our reporting over the years, uh, including some of the specific issues I mentioned uh, just now. So again, thank you so much for having me here, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks for those incredibly important reminders about the context there in Sudan. And, and if you have to go to the hospital in the next 30 minutes, we understand. We all have 911 on our speed dials, just in case. Um, our, our second and, and uh, last discussant uh, is uh, the director of analysis at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies Center on Sanctions and Illicit Finance. CSIF is my favorite new organization in Washington. And this is Yaya Fanusi. And Yaya has experience, deep experience working in the intelligence community and in the private sector on asset recovery, a number of other things that are relevant to our discussion today. So I, again, I'm really excited that you're here and looking forward to seeing what you got to say. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, congratulations to the Enough Project for putting together this panel. It's obviously very cross-cutting. Uh, it's rare to have a panel with a former CIA intelligence analyst and representative from Human Rights Watch together discussing. Um, uh, so this is, this is really great. It shows that you all are, are really um, uh, approaching this from a very broad, uh, broad base. So I'll just quickly go over two things, uh, reflecting on, on this great report. Um, challenges. So I'd say challenges of enforcement and challenges of lifting sanctions, moving up ahead based on some of uh, you know some previous cases. Uh, but first of all, with enforcement, one looking at tools and how uh, tools that have been used in other cases, um, how the market dynamics may be the same or different for Sudan, and also the the problem of of, of targeting. How do you target? Um, the evasion of sanctions. So I'll bring up one case. So about 10 years ago, uh, the US government, went uh, f in the North Korea case, went after a, a bank, relatively small bank, uh, uh, compared to other uh, 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 banks that, uh, Chinese banks dealing with uh, North Korea accounts. So this is during the time when North Korea was, um, uh, you know, back then North Korea was being obstructionist uh, 10 years ago. So, um, but anyway, so there was a small bank called Banco Delta Asia, and the U.S. used this uh, Section 311 of the Patriot Act, which basically gave the U.S. the ability to um, bar U.S. banks from having business with a bank deemed uh, that it was involved with uh, illicit finance, right? So a smaller bank. So the, the strategy was to do this so that there would be a ripple effect, and this sort of happened. So. The U.S. said, you know, this bank, you know, bad bank, North Korean uh, has North Korean accounts, which are doing bad things, um, and U.S. businesses cannot do business with Banco Delta Asia. So this small bank, okay, was, was of course, upset about this. But what happened in the market, other Chinese banks also decided that they would freeze North Korean accounts in their, in their, within their banks. So the Chinese government didn't want to do this, but because of the, the, the potential market effect of the United States saying, okay, hey, we're not going to do business, our banks can't do business with your banks, um, 
the Chinese banks started to, to, to fall in line. And so this was, in, in essence, you know, market dynamics at work. So the question I'd ask from this example is, what are the market dynamics in Sudan um, for using similar tools or a similar approach, right? So how would, and it doesn't have to be Chinese, Chinese banks, but if we're talking about the banking sector, what is the exposure of Chinese banks? How would the Chinese, uh, how would those banks react? How would the Chinese government react? But maybe we're not talking about banking. Maybe, maybe we're talking about the energy sector or, or uh, uh, the mining sector, right? Um, how would regional, uh, uh, other regional banks or regional industries, again, non-US, but maybe uh, Middle Eastern or, or uh, other Asian uh, companies react? What's the sort of market dynamic that will impact, um, uh, that will sort of determine whether or not your measures are going to ripple, right? If they're, whether, whether or not they're gonna have an effect. Um, so that's a question. Of course, the issue of de-risking, which I'm glad the report does talk about, comes from that. Because if if it's so right, U.S. banks are not, you know, mostly not very uh, uh, present and operating in Sudan, right? But uh, again, Asian banks are, uh, Saudi Arabian banks are, UAE, right? Uh, Gulf banks are. So what's the if we were to go and, and implement measures that would squeeze uh, again, sort of third third countries? Um, you know, what would the reaction be, and then what, what are some of the risks of that? Then the other part of, uh, the other challenge in terms of enforcement, again, the issue of, of, of sanctions evasion and targeting. And I think we've talked a little bit about targeting, which is really good. A few things I'll offer to reflect on in the, uh, in the Iran context. I mean, you had, you had a, uh, had and have, you know, with all countries, right? Not just Iran, but with all countries, uh, if you have sanctions, countries and leaders figure out a way to evade. So they can come up with very, very complex, complicated ways of doing that. We see the Panama Papers, right? There are lots of ways that you can dis disguise ownership. And in the Iran uh, uh, context, um, Iran's, Iran, you know, IRGC, Iran Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, you know, so there are measures that bar the US, uh, US persons from um, dealing with a, a company that is owned by the IRGC, right? But what does that ownership mean? In, on the books, it's what, 51%. Uh, but if we look at how, you know, how the world works, 51% is not nece doesn't necessarily disguise, uh, you, know, you can have ownership without having 51%, right? There are lots of other ways to look at beneficial ownership, to look at who's sitting on your board, right? There are other ways that have to be, that you have to consider if you're gonna go after uh, people evading sanctions. Um, so the second part, second thing, the challenge of uh, lifting sanctions. And this is where I think the, the key thing here is, you know, you talk about mission creep, uh, in some senses, you could think of sanctions relief, uh, that there's an issue of sanctions relief creep. Um, and I think the Iran scenario is probably really good for that because number one, right, if you have stronger measures, more targeted measures, um, especially if they're, if they're working, working meaning, uh, uh, y y y you know, the, the party that you're targeting wants to come to the table. And I think I need to digress because there was another point I wanted to make before I go into that, which is, uh, with sanctions lifting, there's the challenge of what's the definition of success, right? And again, we've touched on it a little bit. Is this is the success? Is the goal behavior change? Is the goal regime change? Maybe it's really regime change, but we don't want to see regime change. Or maybe it's you know what, what? So what is the goal? Because if you if if we're not clear on the aim of the new sanctions, then uh, how are we going to know you know when to lift or how to lift or how do we decouple? Uh, uh, the earlier set of sanctions from the new sanctions and the early measures from the new sanctions. So think of the, the Iranian context of the nuclear sanctions versus the non-nuclear sanctions, right? That's what we're dealing with, right? And when the party comes to the table, coming back to the, the, um, the um, my other part, when the party comes to the table to negotiate, especially if they're in an economically vulnerable position, right, there's more, uh, um, uh, uh, more incentive for them to push for, you know, stronger concessions. And you have a situation where um, parties want to, uh, so I'll just use this example, right? If, a if, if Sudan has serious economic and governance issues, right? So what is the potential for Sudan to come to the negotiating uh, table and require or want the, U the US 
to fix, to, to, to give relief that will fix those problems. But those problems are not necessarily because of Sudan uh, sanctions, right? I mean, that's, that, that's the point. Sudan is doing things that uh, are, uh, exacerbates the, the, the issue here. So, so when we think about lifting sanctions, you know, can the U.S. be forced to fix those problems with concessions? Uh, strong, stronger measures raise the price of cooperation with the, with the, with the targeted country seeking more more concessions. So these are some of the things we have to think about. Um, and I'll say, as someone from a coming from an, an analytic background, intel intel analysis background, key to targeting sanctions evaders or sanction evasion sanctions evasion is having the you know the analytic tools and the, the sort of the, the depth of, of resources within our treasury, within the intel community, the folks looking at um, illicit finance, um, often those resources are dependent upon what, what our government is prioritizing, right? What the government is, pr is prioritizing. So if we're gonna have more targeted measures, stronger emphasis on enforcement, we're gonna have to have personnel who, again, have the analytic skills, who are able to, to look at what's being hidden, look at beneficial ownership, tar targeting, targeting from the standpoint of people are hiding and you're trying to figure out where they are and analyze and map those networks. That's really key if you're gonna uh, uh, have compliance and uh, stop in evasion. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. And now we're going to turn for some minutes. We don't have a lot left, but uh, we have about 15 or 13 of them. Um, we're going to turn to the audience for some questions um, and to help us answer these questions, which we don't have enough panelists already. We're bringing up John Hirsch, who's our new Enough Project's new senior analyst on Enough. And he just returned from Sudan, so he can perhaps bring some fresh perspective in what's going on on the ground there. So. In the audience hands, I see a uh, hand here. I think we should collect a few, and then then probably maybe three or four, and then just go down the road and everybody have a shot at answering whichever ones they want. So starting in the back and then in the front and then over here. Yeah, this is, um, so Brad, you had mentioned about corruption fraud and at the EO, and this kind of alludes to what Yaya just said. Um, given that corruption is rampant, uh, in the government of Sudan. Um, do you think having a unilateral sanction uh, for corruption would be beneficial or would be easier or more have more impact if there's a more you know, multilateral approach uh, with EU sanctions or actually having the Sudanese government address it themselves? Good we're, we're collecting, good one. Um, yes ma'am, you are you're next. We're gonna we're gonna ask all the questions at once, so you're welcome to ask yours now. Okay. Um, so my question is actually regarding, um, I'm from the Libya Project, my father from Libya. Um, uh, my question is regarding to what steps will the U.S. take with uh, their ally, the Saudi, the Saudi government, writing a $1.7 billion check uh, to construct three dams along the Nile that will submerge basically over 500 archaeological sites and pyramids and also it will displace um, close to 400,000 Nubians from their villages that have been living there thousands of years. Now this wouldn't be sanctions more so towards Sudan, but this would be more relations with um, the Saudi government, you know, and their policies, because it doesn't matter if there's economic sanctions, they can obtain money from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and so on. Good, good, yes sir, yes sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to share this for uh, you know, the next uh, chance, and I think you know, uh, the all uh, speak of this uh, talk about the sanctions, uh, how the sanctions should be fighting uh, against the, the Sudan. And none of you, uh, unfortunately, yes, uh, talk about uh, any other, you know, way of uh, engagement, you know, with the, whatever you know, Sudan is uh, uh, governing. You know, is this, you know, the ultimate goal of, uh, of you? Uh, if, can, if I can assume that, you know, the ultimate goal of you that is just to solve the Sudanese issues, the problems in the two areas, and therefore, uh, I think Sudan uh, is a 30, 33 million, you know, uh, citizen. Okay. And I do believe that, you know, these sanctions could harm only those, those 30, 33 uh, million, because uh, if you just go, uh, and add to your record, you know, beside these, you know, violations from the Sudanese, you know, uh, government uh, affiliated the first ones, go and add, you know, how these sanctions could harm uh, the ordinary people, the, go and visit the hospitals, 
get a record from there and go and do the, the whatever the own services, you know, uh, institutions you run, you will talk, you know, how this, you will get you know, a notion about how these you know, sanctions are to this. Uh, talking about the vulnerability, you know, about the government, this is something uh, not, not new, you know, because uh, these sanctions lasted right now for more than 20 years, and this is the same, you know, the target that you, 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 you mentioned before, you know, before 20, 20 years, uh, most of you also were, you know, uh, having the same position, which is the uh, government is, is in a vulnerable, you know, uh, position. I can tell you something, you know, uh, yes, the sanctions are serious, right now the government, uh, most of, uh, you know, it's functioning uh, with, the, with regard to the economic uh, aspects, is uh, uh, carrying or handling, you know, through the what uh, we can call uh, a cash economy. You, know? uh, you can imagine that, you know, where when you cannot uh, have any access to international, uh, you know, financial institutions, uh, you have just to apply whatever you know, uh, uh, whatever you know, gains that you have in the sanction situation. So that right now, I can tell you that you know, Sudan is that uh, very turmoil you know, uh, region is full of functioning, you know, without any other you know, so, so I can tell you, just uh, please, you know, if you can just uh, talking about the peace, Mr. Tomise, uh, you know, uh, the government just has uh, assigned, you know, the, and in last March, uh, a, a very basic, you know, uh, agreement for peace settlement in the industrial, the, the two areas in Indarfor, but, you know, the other uh, groups, they refuse just to sign it. If, uh, if you know the notion that you are speaking about this, please just uh, try to make it uh, with very you know, positive engagement. You know. Ask the United States to get, you know, what well, you know, they don't have to do it before in the CTA. They just went uh, uh, in applying that CTA till the registration of South Sudan, this full recognition from Sudan. This is, uh, I, I think, very good example. Can be just applied even, you know, for that forward and the forward. Okay, thank you. So that's that's three. I think why don't we go ahead, go ahead, sure. Why don't we take the four? Because I think we'll probably then just do a round of, of responses and that's it. Sure, no problem. Laura Cutler from the Darfur Interfaith Network. I've been leading a vigil outside the embassy of Sudan for over ten years, hoping to get traction on the issue of the humanitarian abuses um, now in more than just Darfur, which this is genocide. What would you recommend to the average person? Not action by our government, but is there anything that the person who cares so much about saying never again to a horrible genocide like this could do? Okay, thanks. All right, good. So we have four questions on the table, some with sub questions in them. Um, do, would it make sense to go down the row and start the. Uh, what? <laughs> this guy, he shows up with the panel and starts telling me how to run. <laughs> Actually, thank you very much. I think we'll start with you, John, because we're all so doggone eager to hear from you. <laughs> well, um, you know, I would just like to say, you know, the question from the embassy, if I could. Um, well, I travel to Car too, and I met with civil society activists, I met with academics, human rights lawyers. Sudanese development organizations, uh, Sudanese nationals working for the large international development organizations there. And sanctions came up in every single conversation. But it was not in the sense of, please, please, we don't need sanctions. It's that the sanctions need to work better, and they need to work better in targeting the people who should be hurt, who should feel the consequences of sanctions, and to provide a easier access to the people in Sudan to alleviate some of the difficulties for the humanitarian groups, medical, uh, you know, this student exchange, the people to people exchange, the things that need to be happening. So this is what we want to happen, and I think our report lays this out. The people who are evading the sanctions and continuing the conflict need to feel the bite of this financial pressure. And to any extent that we can, we would also like to you know, ease the burden to the who are doing the good development work in Susan So I would also just look to your budget though. I mean it's it's disingenuous to, to me to hear that sanctions are the cause for gender development in Sudan. If 
you know, officially it's 25% goes to military and security. But, you know, our good friends from New Reports would claim it was 70, and I've seen as high as 78. And at the same time, it's 2.4% on health and education. So if you're going to spend that much on militarizing and controlling society versus investing in the people and health and education that's so desperately needed, it's hard for me to hear that the sanctions are really the cause of that. And for that, yes, we have a question about that. Uh, so it's actually this large enough, you know, to ban it all the uh, government official. This is what we, we call for. Uh, you know, we I really have a time problem. It's, it's not the... Uh, yeah, 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 it's, 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 it's okay. Of, you know, the country Sir. is in war against so many <laughs> others. You know, how do you expect you know, from the government to allocate you know, its, uh, its something? Back to diplomacy school for you. Okay, got gotcha. you. All right. John, did you fit? Are you? Yep. All right. Thank you so much. We are so glad. It was worth the wait, buddy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Andrea, you're next. I'll just be very brief. Um, and again, my, my remarks will be targeted to the gentleman from the embassy with, with whom I've spoken before. Um, if you read Human Rights Watch's reports, uh, I don't think you'll find a call for sanctions in Sudan in, in many years. It's not one of our more frequent recommendations, though in, in some cases we do support it. But um, you know, I think it's pretty clear that the government of Sudan has uh, a variety of options available to it if it wants to increase engagement. And that includes things like holding security forces accountable for abuse, you know, changing laws so they don't discriminate against women, not arbitrarily detaining and torturing uh, detainees and so on. You know, The response to all of the things I outlined, which are all perpetrated by or with the assent of the government. And I think that um, while we engage, I mean, the embassy has frequently attends events that I speak at and invites me to, to go speak to them, um, and we share our reports with them in advance of publication, but there's only so much that engagement can do. We can discuss human rights abuses and their failure to address them, but that's a, a relatively short conversation, though we will continue to have it. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Yaya, please. Um, so I'll just say something. I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna tap on a specific question, uh, but I'll, I'll say maybe in response to, uh, to the gentleman, that uh, in terms of the call for you know making sure that we're we're looking for a peaceful resolution, I think that's uh, I think that that's what I've gotten from you know from from the report that that's really the aim, um, and also I, the, the point. Is that you know in 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 a sense I think of this from a personal perspective you know this is bigger than Sudan right I mean this is sort of uh, strategically and the timing is right uh, if, you know, but um, you know if I think about the national security issues you know happening and I look at you know the continent of Africa sub-Saharan Africa um, this is this is bigger than just just Sudan and 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 the United States has to get smarter and more adept um, at um, dealing with uh, the conflicts and, and the cause of conflicts, and uh, we have to get smarter at, at using economic tools. And I think right now we're witnessing this within within DC, within the government, within policy circles. Um, there's really a neat, there's a, a strong interest in getting smarter and stronger um, with with using economic tools. So this is a part of. Uh, of, of being more nimble to address some of the problems uh, in Africa, but elsewhere around the world as well. Great, thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks, um, so the first question about uh, corruption sanctions, just a, a couple of quick thoughts on that. I mean, one, and, and, and Yaya made it his point, um, you have to have the resources to do the right kind of targeting, and that's not uh, necessarily what we see consistently within the US government now which is a, a chance to mention the, the initiative that we've, uh, we've launched called The Century, which is trying to do a lot of that work and develop the research to identify who the, who the actors are and put that information in the hands of uh, uh, regulators of law enforcement and others so that they can act. Um, so you know, there, there need to be more resources at it. We, as The Century, will continue to do that work. You know, initially, yes, I think there is some effect to unilateral um, sanctions on that. Uh, related to corruption and other things as a, um, A, to ensure that you're doing enforcement, and B, to set that message and to set a priority. It was one, you know, Peter's first lesson was have a broad coalition, and I think from our perspective, you know, it's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. There's a lot of push-pull that needs to happen to get that broad coalition in place with Sudan. It starts by the U.S. prioritizing what's important and making clear what the message is, and I think we can get to a multilateral approach to things like anti-corruption, and the Panama Papers has come up a couple times, the UK, you know, Prime Minister Cameron is hosting a summit on anti-corruption in a couple of weeks. That's a that's a topic. That's a an issue that's be getting very uh, very global very quickly. And so the more we can 
uh, hone the the research and the idea the identities of, of who's involved in corruption within Sudan it, it, it plays into the the this infrastructure that's growing across the board um, ultimately we do want to see it be multilateral but but it has to start here uh, or it has to start somewhere um, I'll, I'll let the Nuba Dam question um, go to others who are more expert on that I think we've addressed the um, the embassy question but again reiterating throughout all of the talk of pressures uh, is for the purpose of getting to the point of engagement and, and, and getting a, a real process on the ground. And it's, it's the, the lack of a real process on the ground that really motivates what we're doing. And, 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 and I would just reiterate the points that both John and Andrea made are around the situation on the ground and the situation, uh, the government's responsibility for uh, the lack of uh, infrastructure on health, education, human rights. Uh, that's not the fault of sanctions. Um, there can be things that that uh, that relate to it, but ultimately that starts uh, very much with the government. In terms of the average person uh, and advocacy around that, I, we have our advocacy team here who may have a who may have ideas to to throw in there. From my perspective, uh, as sort of the you know sanctions geek on the team, uh, I mean I think there is a lot more that can be done. As these pressures have developed and as the government has focused more on them and Secretary Liu has done speeches, the president has talked about, um, has developed a kind of very nuanced foreign policy, I think there is an element of, you know, people who care about these issues, uh, the average person understanding how these tools work and doing the advocacy to the Treasury Department, to the, to the executive branch. They're not necessarily parts of the government that are used to hearing from people, but having sat in those seats, I can tell you it makes an impact when people demonstrate that they care and that they demonstrate that this is not a second tier priority, it should be a first tier priority, and that there are things that can be done and that they shouldn't be just used at other priority areas. Those are, other foreign policies are certainly important, but this is something we care about too, and I think so it's just making that message heard to parts of the government that aren't aren't used to hearing uh, from from the activist uh, and average uh, kind of average person community. So. Great, great, Peter. No, I'm, I'm just going to touch on two of the questions. First, this uh, this question about corruption sanctions, and I, I actually think uh, corruption sanctions are in part an answer to the embassy question, right? How could the uh, government, even the Sudanese government, be against sanctions that are on corruption. I mean, obviously, as individuals, they could be, but like, you know, that's sending a message to the people of Sudan that you know what we're talking about is what their own regime is doing. We're not trying to hurt uh, hurt ordinary people. I mean, I actually think, sort of more broadly, corruption sanctions are an underused uh, element of sanctions. I mean, I think it, 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 that when you can target uh, actual acts of corruption by a um, government, you know, it's a way to use sanctions to drive a wedge between the government and its people, whereas often we've seen the messaging around sanctions being, you know, that it bring, you know, the governments are using sanctions to kind of generate support from their people because they're blaming us for problems that they're responsible for. So I think uh, very useful to do corruption mm -hmm. sanctions. And as Brad said, yes, we would want, you know, the Europeans to join us in that, but you got to start somewhere. Uh, and so I would think if you can't get the Europeans to do it, we should do it ourselves. Then just very quickly on this question of what can individuals do, you know, other than advocacy, um, I would say, uh, you know, just, just one little thing for individuals. Um, you know, when, you, when you're buying a piece of jewelry, make sure uh, you're asking your jeweler about whether there is any Sudanese gold uh, in that and what they've done. Uh, Brad and I did uh, what the jeweler has done to keep it out. Brad and I, particularly Brad, when we were working together at State, a lot of work on conflict uh, minerals, conflict diamonds, conflict gold, things like that. The industry needs to know their customer base cares about it. I mean, that's one thing we heard from industry over and over again. They want to do the right thing, but for them to justify the expense, they need to know their customer base cares. So make sure that people buying jewelry are asking that question of their jeweler to put the pressure on the supply chain all the way back up. Great, great. Alma, you want to take a shot? No, we let the Sudanese embassy guys go, and you call me to... Uh, <laughs> all the fun is gone. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, um, then I will answer your question, if I can. Um, and it, it, is, it is also part of the, of the work that we, we should look into, how countries like Saudi Arabia and others are involved in the uh, issues of Sudan, and they are helping the Sudanese government go around the sanctions regime. or And you heard from our brother from the embassies there that they are now doing cash transactions 
you know, from a company now we are be becoming a hot dog stand. <laughs> We're dealing with cash only. Uh, so the Nubian uh, land and, 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 the, and the treasures that were buried or were going to be buried under the dams that are still under construction or, or coming into the uh, near future, this is not just the Nubian or this, even the Sudanese uh, heritage. It, th this is the history of, you know, all these human beings that are inside this room and, and outside of here around the world. And, and, and we believe that because it is one of the all the civilizations on Earth that it, we only scratch the surface on the artifacts and the studies and the, you know, like, things like the Meroitic language that, you know, uh, 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 only a few people know today or the Meroitic culture that, uh, you know, um, um, uh, Professor Gates, Jr. of Harvard, was, was talking about when he talked about a, a university that was in, in Meroe 2,000 years ago, a whole university with everything that, you know, a, a modern university has today. So that is, that is the history of, of mankind, and, 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 and we are going to lose that. And for what? For, for, for a corrupt regime uh, that is uh, uh, trying to change the country uh, and, and, and to impose a, a, a culture and a language and, 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 and a religion of their own choice and, and to mold the country after their own image. It's, it's, it's wrong and the world should not stand for that and we should all together work to, to end the, 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 a, a regime that looks like this. Uh, and I think the, um, the trigger you know, started a long time ago uh, with the, um, the students and the young people that are uh, you know, fighting today as we are talking today in the University of Khartoum and University of Gadarif and Niala and Dungula and elsewhere, the students are fighting uh, for you know, freedom of speech and freedom of expression and change in, in the country and the political parties are coming together and they are doing this peacefully and I hope that they, you know, they rush it up and, 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 and they get rid of this regime because it, it's corrupt and it's been there for um, the 37 to 38 years and we haven't seen anything except you know, uh, the reports from uh, you know, places uh, in Darfur and Nuba Mountains and in Khartoum and, and all the atrocities that we have seen and the corruption that uh, is rampant in the, in the entire regime and elsewhere. So I think what we need is help to change the situation. And we did this before. I, I think the Sudanese did this in October of 1964. They did it in, in, in uh, April of 1985. So I think for those of you who know anything about sports, we are going for the hat-trick guys. <laughs> so help us. Well, it uh, le left to me for three thank yous. First one is to the con congressional sponsors. Again, Royce Capuano, McGovern, Rooney, McCall, these folks have really have been in the uh, forefront of pushing on these issues and d demanding that there be more executive branch action for many years. Second, thanks to this great panel. Very, very excited. I've learned a lot. And I'm glad we recorded it because I'm going to watch it again. Um, and then thirdly, uh, rather unconventionally, I'd like to give a big thank you to the Sudan government, which will inevitably change its policies as a result of this panel <laughs> and negotiate a lasting peace deal for the people of Sudan. Thank you very much. <laughs>